communities, you okay, had great. the wide web, the or C++ came in uh, so, so much better than Pascal. I do miss some of the features though, like um, nested functions. Anyway, so uh, at that time I was working in Japan and, and uh, I wrote Dynamic Spirit. I'll get a little bit into that later on. And then in the late 90s, uh, there's uh, a <laughs> already. I started uh, noticing this um, group of people churning out C++ code. And of course, um, I remember C++ report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, seminal work on template metaprogramming, expression templates. <coughs> that was the time. That was the time when uh, it was also mm -hmm. exciting. I mean, thoughts so article about the meta template programming on, on Blitz++ was in 1995, so... It yeah, so, um, late 90s, I from still 90s remember to that, 95. that one that I was completely yeah. mind-blown and, and didn't understand what was I was awesome. talking about. Yeah. It was yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I couldn't get the idea. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Compound time? Okay, then what, what then? <laughs> yeah. so, then you can compute a value at uh, compile time, okay. So, so what? So what? So <laughs> then, uh, at, at some point in time, it um, slowly sinked in, and um, following some conversations at Boost, of course, and um, Complan C++ moderated. That's where where I, I, uh, I ha uh, had a, a virtual friend named Alexandrescu. <laughs> so anyway. Let's get into that. So it um, shouldn't take long here. Uh, this is just a uh, chronological list of what has what transpired from mm -hmm. then till um, pretty much now. Okay, so dynamic spirit. Uh, this, this is how it all started. Uh, it's, what's unique about this is that it's library based. From the start, it's library based, as opposed to a YAC, where it's a tool that you run. So it's library based, and uh, yeah, it's recursive descent. There's no separate lexer. So pretty much what we have now, but the only difference is that it's dynamic, and I use virtual member functions to um, to do the parse. So uh, no template hackery no template things at that point. It's just plain old object-oriented virtual functions. But um, I think the important point there is that uh, that's the point where I'm already composing parser objects. So... Um, is it taken from Haskell? This is the parser? You know what, that came Haskell. later on. I think uh, the same ideas, right? Yes, the same ideas. And um, I, I, I realized that um, what I'm doing is the same thing as the Haskell guys are doing, but differently. Uh, in this case, my influence was a syntax diagram. So I, I wanted to create objects that model the syntax diagrams and interpret that. So that's how it started. And it worked well. Okay, here's a grant, um, what I called back then the Spirit EV, EV, EVNF. Here's a sample. This is a text file that you pass, you give it, you give us uh, the uh, parser compiler a string or a text or anything, the source code, and um, you pass it to the compiler and that generates the uh, uh, parser composition for you. In this case, uh, this is the meta language of the parser itself. So it, this is how Spirit is written in Spirit. So you have the grammar and the production. And so it's mostly the same as we have now, except that this is more EBNF. For example, you have the post stars there. 
and you know, some other stuff that you can do with C++. <coughs> yeah, that's, I, I did, dug that, and that's around 1999. Interestingly, uh, I call them match objects, the same as Eric D is doing now, right? Yep. So, there's some similarities there. That's the match object. Very simple. Um, I, I love very simple classes, one-shot classes that does only one thing, and this is one of them. It's just a parser object. It just does one thing, and well, what's that? Parse. That's the base class. That's the base class. So, what were you using for a lexer then? Or? No lexer. So, how did you? Okay. Uh, um, you, you're a few slides ahead. Oh. Okay. So I, I'll go there, and that's the reason why uh, why I had to. I thought about or writing a static spirit. That's an, that, that's the base class, and this is an end match, which or what we call now the sequence. Pretty much the same. The only difference is that it's using virtual functions instead of compile time polymorphism. So you parse the left, and if that's okay, then you parse the right. And it works because of um, short circuiting. So very easy, very simple, and very tight, very light. Okay, so static spirit, how, how that came to be. Um, your question, answering by your question, uh, I hand coded the parser at first. The parser that parses the grammar, I hand coded that. I didn't like that. So that's why I, I, I had, to, I thought about um, doing something, do, formalizing the grammar, the meta grammar of spirit itself, and <coughs> writing a tool that can generate. Uh, small and tight parsers at compile time. So that's how it came to be. I wanted it to bootstrap spirit, the dynamic spirit. So static spirit was just supposed to be uh, meant to be just for bootstrapping it, at, uh, at, the, at the beginning. So that's how it all started. So possible but not efficient. Um, uh, I can r r write spirit in spirit because of the meta language, but the, the result will be not as efficient, so I want to have something more efficient. That's why I had to uh, write, thought about writing a static spirit. So I need a super efficient parser. So it must be as efficient as a hand-coded parser. And it must be very simple, very simple. So I, it will start it out very simple. So um, here are my influences. Template metaprogram. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. This ambiguated blommable expression template. Oh, yeah. I'm not familiar with that. That was a cool I'm surprised by the dates. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize in '95 people were thinking about CRPP and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's the one I, I mentioned here. The the uh, article about the expression templates. They wrote the Blitz Plus, plus library at that time, where for the first time uh, they used template and template meta programming to get rid of the temporaries and matrix multiplication expressions. So. What, what we're talking about today, they did there, and uh, that what, that paper was fairly influential because it showed that C++ code, matrix multiplication C++ is 10% faster than in Fortran. Mm. Everybody was just astonished because nobody expected that to happen, and that's exactly that paper what, what shows shows that. Yes, Thomas. 
I was going to say he actually shortly thereafter he was the one who showed that you can implement a Turing machine using C++ yeah, yeah. templates. Yeah, he did that <coughs> before that. Yeah. That was a paper which just blew my mind because I didn't understand anything. It was completely beyond me, beyond me what, what we were doing. Yeah, same here. It took some time before uh, it slowly sink in. Yeah. Okay, so at around sometime late nine. Around around 2000, um, I had the, the static uh, spirit parser, and um, I was work. I was in Japan at that time, and um, I was um, lurking um, behind um, CLC plus plus M and uh, Boost, and um, I I somehow had a correspondence with um, Andre at that time. And uh, he was the one, he was one of the first to uh, saw the spirit code. And so that's what he, he, he told me. Okay, so static spirit. It's almost the same as what, what he had. Um, a, a change of name in, instead of a match objects. Um, I now have um, parcel objects, which is... Um, for me, more is more fits what they intend. They are parser parsers anyway. So yeah, CRTP. Uh, I'm sure everyone here knows CRTP, so we have to go there, right? So anyway, uh, just get the derived and call a member function of the derived Same without the actual now functions. What next? Seeing that this was back in 95, that, that, that one article you were talking about, I can see why they thought it was curious. Yes, it doesn't seem so curious yes. today, does it? <laughs> That's from James Copeland. I think he com uh, compacted the term. Yeah. Now we call it CRTP. It's something that it maybe was just kind of discovered. Hey, yeah. cool, you could do this. That's yeah. Yeah. Pretty awesome, pretty <laughs> awesome. That's 2003, so uh, it's still there. Um, Was it the uh, article? Yes. And see the is the, Yeah, uh, I, I, we Dan Nafro and I. Uh, Dan Nafro was one of the active spirit developers at that time, and uh, we wrote. I'm not sure if you've read that one. Um, we had a CUJ article on um, inline parsing. So just I just um, coded a little bit. So um, like I, what I showed you before, we had this. Uh, now this is the sequence. Before it was called the end machine. It's. I'm sorry. That one thing I was wondering is, um, you mentioned James Compliant. What whatever happened to him? He used to be like the big C++ guy back in the 90s. I have no idea. Okay. I have no Did idea. Did you the patterns? I, I had emailed him like about a year ago. He's in Copenhagen teaching now? somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, like Copenhagen or something now. Okay. He's around, he's, I mean, he floats around. But. Okay. Okay, so there you go. The static version of Spirit. Now, without using virtual functions, it's um, almost the same. Yeah, you can say that. Uh, the only difference is that um, it's using templates and CRTP. And then. Uh, came the boost introduction around May 21. So that's May 21. And so, uh, this is my email to the boost mailing list. And that's by the way that email which brought me into Spur because I saw saw that thing on the mailing list. <coughs> and I was really curious about that. My, uh, my, my history was, I mean, if I might change sure. at that point, uh, when I was a student in, in uh, St. Peterburg, Leningrad. I was a student there and I was, was learning there. And uh, I mean, it was Russia, you know, a bit far away and, and not, not as, as open and, and everything as we know it now. And one day I got my hands onto the PSD sources, you know, the whole tape with the sources of PSD. Well, it was a great thing okay. because it, it, I don't know where I got that on the black market somewhere. Or <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that the most 
interesting thing for me was to pull out likes and yak from, mm -hmm. from those sources and try to understand what those programs are, were doing because yeah, no idea. Yeah, Flex and Yak just sounds sounds funny, and you read something about them, but what are they doing? And finally, I got to understand that hey, that's tools which generate code when compiled do something. And suddenly, for me, it was an eye opener because I understand I understood that when you can actually generate programs, you can do everything. Right? I mean, programs on, by hand is one thing, but writing a program which writes a program. Right. It's, yeah. it's some, something completely different. And that's my uh, introduction to this parser concept. I, I, I really like that. Okay. So that's why I was really intrigued by, by, by this mail. Okay, and, so, um, uh, after, yeah. there were, um, after this, uh, there were quite a few, in fact, a lot, that um, replied and um, showed interest. So uh, this is the standard way of uh, asking for um, interest in Boost, right? So if you have a library, go in there, ask people, are you interested with this kind of library, this kind of uh, blah, 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 does this blah, blah, blah. Then if, you, if they are interested, then good for you. So you, you proceed to the next step, which is to uh, boostify your code and somehow make it uh, more compatible with what they have there. My original code was written using Code Warrior. I was a Mac Macintosh guy at that point, and it didn't compile in any of the compilers, uh, popular compilers at the time. So uh, I, uh, some people helped me in compiling to MSBC. That was 6.0. <laughs> 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 More Borland, yeah. and of course GCC 2.95. I think the first uh, spirit version you presented there were seven files, right? Seven header files. Seven yeah. header files. But it didn't, it that, didn't compile. It. So uh, my first, <laughs> my first, uh, the first outburst of it's not compiling. What's happening here? But um, there are other people who got interested and ported the code to some of the compilers there. <laughs> so yeah, some of the um, replies, Vesa. Anyone here know VESA? Mm -hmm. Preprocessor yeah. guy? Yeah. He started he the preprocessor library, by the way. So he started the preprocessor library. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's with the picture, though? <laughs> Does it doesn't look that, like a programmer to me, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's on a Boost website it's still, so if you look at it, it's on that. It's an eye opener at home. These folks are cool. <laughs> Greg Galvin, smart pointer guy, shared po oh, no, um, scope pointer, am I correct? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. It's one of the first boost folks there. It's one of those kind of good <laughs> generation where you had to have big beer to be a beer. He was here, <laughs> he was here uh, two years ago. Huh? He was here two he years was ago. Here, yeah. Yeah. Jamming yeah, with me, and with that. Yeah, Looks I like wrote, a, I wrote the trip report. Oh yeah, yeah, that's it. Now this guy looks like a ZZ Top. <laughs> something. Then Hubert Holland. Looks trust. Uh, I I think I can trust this guy. He's floating in the ocean, so <laughs> looks cool. And of course, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we looked back then. <laughs> okay, that's probably my part. Yep. When, when I started with the Spirit, I thought, hey, let's do something. Well, I wanted to use it in one of my projects, and I thought, let's do something completely independent and try to learn how it works. And I took the 
there's a C grammar available on the web, it's still available, yak based. And I took that and just redid that in, in spirit. And it worked really well. And then after I got rid of the left recursion, which is inherent to the to the yak grammar, so I had to redo it. It really passes C plot to C and does still and as as far as I know you're using it in production yeah. really, unchanged from those days. And I sent this mail, that's the original mail I dug out from the I oh, know that's a private name, right? I, I found that in my archives. When I asked him, hey, are you interested in that? So that was my introduction into, into Spirit. And Joe was very enthusiastic, said, hey, yeah, sure, send that over and we do this. And so, um, for that, I used Intel version 5, one of the first Intel compilers, which was more or less C, uh, more or less usable. It was quite some, some strange part of there, but it worked. And the C parser is still available on the on the spiritual repository, so if somebody wants to look there, add it. It's really nice and clean, and you, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. use it for yourself. So it does it parse only, or does it do the BSD? No, it's part, it's a parser only, and it doesn't uh, handle type type types. Okay. Because for that you need the select uh, semantic analysis to feed it back to the parser. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Does it need a semantic feed? No, no, it's really, it doesn't do type devs, but otherwise it's a full language browser. It was easier back then. Um, th there are a couple of uh, people contributing spirit parsers. I remember Pascal Parser yeah. and uh, Dan Nuffer wrote an XML parser, but mostly for academic purposes just to um, try it out. I have to mark the dates, you know. 16th of October, 2011, we, we have to share a virtual pizza or something. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Good. Okay. What's amazing is that you guys have this much history. I mean, uh, you know, did you keep all those emails from way back then? Yeah. Or did you know it was going to be historical? Or, was, or did you just never delete it? <laughs> yeah. Mostly for reference, it's better to keep the um, original emails. Mm -hmm. And that's how we basically designed the code. Um, it's a collaboration, and uh, he, he, he is living in Germany, and I'm in the Philippines, and there are a couple more. Uh, Dan Nuffer is here in the States, and that's basically how we collaborate, email through email. So we, we design through email. That's how it's done. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm uh, moving on. Uh, Original static spirit was a transduction parser where uh, it's it basically a source source translator. So you have you, uh, the idea is just to uh, have text file and then convert that to another text file. Uh, it did have semantic actions, something like that. It just gives you the iterators <coughs> to the first and the last that matches, and it's up to you to in interpret that. For example, in this case, it's pushing back. It's converting this string into a number and pushing it back into a vector somehow. There. So um, Dan Muffer, one of the original uh, <coughs> contributors, uh, wrote an ADST for Spirit as well. But I focus on the attributes. I'm more interested with the attributes. So slowly, some of the primitives uh, uh, got to have attributes. So um, the most obvious are the primitives like the integers, character parsers. So if, for example, an integer, um, it's kind of uh, wasteful if you have to parse it again. So you already have, you know that that's an integer, then um, you have to go do, do this again, that's kind of wasteful. So that's uh, one of the reasons why we had attributes from that point. So the primitives started to gain the attributes. So in, if with um, attributes for the primitives, you don't have to reparse it again. So you just, you just you have the string. So our original um, goal 
was to have something like this for semantic expressions where you can do this somehow to compute the attribute of the rules. Before, uh, we didn't have a way to do that. It's just because of, uh, apart from um, ha the, the primitives that uh, have attributes, all the rest don't. So if you have a sequence, if you have A followed by B, you won't get the attributes of that. You'll just be past the first and last. That's how classic spirit worked. But this was uh, our, the original intent of how to uh, get, have, get the attributes from from the uh, from the nodes and pass it to the uh, rules. So semantic expressions. This is the how Phoenix all, uh, got started. So I, I wanted to do that. This is how uh, we we. This is how it was done before. These are um, function objects that's predefined pre 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 for you. So um, with Spirit, with what's called Spirit X, it's, it's experimental. We wanted to do this. So it's more flexible. So you can have arbitrary expressions that compose to function objects that can be attached as semantic actions. So it became known as the SE framework, semantic expressions framework. So it's very simple. You have only, uh, Spirit only needed three arguments, and that's very simple. And uh, arguments were always const. No we don't need any mutation there, and things like that. Uh, so it was kind of uh, pre pretty much a very simple, just for spirit. And later on, uh, it, it was generalized and decoupled and became known as Phoenix. That's me. That's for later. Yeah. Um, Spirit evolved and we developed utility parses. Some of you still remember this P, common P, conflicts. And those parses are tricky, as it turned out. I mean, it seemed to be fairly easy to parse a list, right? All that you have to do, you have an item, and you have a delimiter, and you want to stick it together. So an item followed by arbitrary number of delimiters and followed by an item, for those of you not, not as fluent in spirit, that forms essentially a comma separated list or something. And uh, we were thinking, hey, but what happens if the limiter is part, is part of what item is matching as well? So if you have a character as the delimiter or star car, something, any character uh, as an item, any, any character here, but the delimiter is a comma, then this thing doesn't work because the item will eat the comma as well, right? And you won't be able to pass it. So we thought, hey, why not the priest, and that's why the list parser has, has been created, uh, why not just, if I get this one, just do something like that under, under the hood. So I minus stands for difference, so pass that, but not that. So it will pass um, any character, but the comma, followed by the comma, followed by any character, but the comma. Um, that works fine, and it's actually what the list parser is doing. But what happens if we have semantic actions? <coughs> if we have semantic actions, we get that. So we parse any character, call the semantic action when it matches, and then we check if it was a comma. And since semantic actions is something you can't roll back, mm -hmm. the comma ended up inside as a result of the item parser as well, right? Is that um, mm -hmm. so? That's why we thought no, that can't be the solution. And um, thinking further, essentially what we wanted was that mm -hmm. we want to have 
item minus the limit of one that merges, just call the semantic action, and so on and so on. And we finally ended up implementing a meta framework which transforms a parser at compile time. Very much what we are doing right now. Which, whenever it sees a construct like that, it transforms it into a parser like that. And that what, that's what's happening in, in the list P and the configs and the common parser as well. Another example. What happens if we have a clean stuff? Then that expands, expands to this. So any number of characters minus a comma. That's not what we want, right? What we actually want is something like that. So we want to have the clean outside of the, of the, of the delimiter. And this transformation was done by the list parser as well. So the list parser essentially, and the context comment are, are very similar in this respect, essentially took whatever the user specified as item and delimiter and at compile time did some analysis of, hey, is that an action parser? Is that a unary parser? And so on. And if it matched, it transformed it into the thing the user might have expected. And yeah, that's the beginning of somehow a bit of proto is in there already. In fusion too. In fusion too. If you think of um, tree manipulation and sequence manipulation. I mean, here it's done by associating a factory with each parser. So each parser knew how to recreate itself. So by traversing the tree, which the parser tree, and looking at each node, we could recreate a different tree containing the same parser elements, but just sticking them together in a, in a different way. By this calling this exactly the sorts of problems that I was running into when I was developing Expressive, Expressive exactly, which right, sure. uh, eventually led to Proto. Yeah, yeah. right. Definitely. So, uh, what the point of that is, and we will see more examples of that, that even if it was written in 2002, the, all the main ideas of what we have today are already there. We just have generalized. Been, we just have not been able to impl implement them properly because we didn't have those nice underlying utility libraries we have today. Today is it snap, you know? Yeah. Uh, but there it was. I mean, and the compilers were awful, right? That, that added to <laughs> the, the yeah, we have to struggle with compiler errors in ICE. Um, the second thing we did in Spirit Meta, you see it was in October 2002. Um, I wrote a mail to the mailing list when I, I found a way to, to do what, what we wanted to do all the time, you know? I mean, um, some expression and referring to the elements of that expression using placeholders. And what what was written at that time was a grouping directive which does a, the, the trickery underneath. And as you can see, nowadays we would write underscore one, underscore two. At that time you had to write <coughs> underscore one, underscore three because this thing just was there and we couldn't skip it. Right. No fusion, right? Uh, but again, the, the, the ideas have been there, already, and it took us almost 10 years to, to implement them. Right? There seems to be some syntax error yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. right, about that. Yeah, it's a yeah. closing, mm -hmm. yeah. closing uh, bracket. Yeah, okay. closing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry for that. So the, the ideas here uh, were somehow um, extracted and generalized. So. Uh, uh, one of the original libraries that uh, that got influenced with this is um, what you call now the fusion. Mm -hmm. So it's basically just a generalization of everything you have here, which is uh, manipulation of heterogeneous types and values, tuples. I mean, how that works was it, it built a, a parser tree Spirit didn't work on, on expression trees at that time. It just had the parser tree and walked that parser tree using a transform, but a very specialized transform which had four policies, one for unary parsers, one for primitive parsers, one for binary parsers, and one for, I don't yeah. know, 
what was the force? I don't remember. So, and for each of those, you could specify your transform, what you wanted to do in, in each of the nodes. And it generated the new parser. And what this group directive was, it applied this transform to that parser expression, walked the tree to the leaves, and attached a semantic action to the leaves, which stored whatever those guys produced. Mm. And afterwards, just collected it together and passed it to the to the semantic action which is attached to it. So some of the ideas are there, uh, but uh, not as abstract and then not as, as nicely laid out as we have today. Yeah. So when did fusion start uh, becoming yeah. fusion? It was Next. right here? Oh, okay. You're right here, another slide oh, again. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you can. Uh, yeah, that's essentially the comment in that source file which exactly explains what I just did. Uh, it attaches special actors as a semantic action recursively to all leaf parsers of the original binary parser. This is done by the help of post auto traversal. So during the parsing process, every leaf parser calls the corresponding operator functions of, of the respective actor, providing parser results. And they are constructed such that they assign the parser result value to the corresponding member of the overall result tuple. So we have all the tuples here. Yeah. Just the, the semantic actions just assign the stuff to the proper element of our So you can dig in the, in the archives, you have that comment in the sources. Yeah, and that's what this transform. For policies, uh, plain policy, binary action, and binary process. And each of those you could do different things. In this case, we just overloaded the, the uh, plain policy because we wanted to attach something to the leaves. And leave all the other uh, intermediate parses alone. Yeah, I'd it. say that's one of the um, Hartmut's coolest contributions at that time, <laughs> which influenced quite a bit of um, the future. And uh, there, there was this actually this meta framework inside spirit that only he and I knew it was undocumented. It's still in there. The it's still in there, it's yeah. It's still very classic, so if you want to try it out, it's still very in classic, the yeah. You can, can have a look at the code. There. Okay, so um, after all this um, came the formal review. Ready? Get set? Go! <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that was an unforgettable experience for me. Nerve the job for the formal review. <laughs> it's like a bungee jumping. Is that you? No, of course not. It's just a picture I got from the web. <laughs> I don't know. Um, library authors like Eric. Anyone here, uh, apart from Eric, with the library in Boost already? So it's really a nerve-wracking experience, but it's um, adrenaline fixing when you have all these commands and you have to reply to all all the um, things that people say. Of course, on pros and cons, uh, and somehow you have to find a way to satisfy the reviews, and at the same time. Not create a situation where it's, it becomes like uh, designed by committee, so you still have control, but at the same time, uh, you have to cater to the ideas that's coming in. It's really, it's, uh, it was really uh, an experience. Um, uh, I wouldn't think of redoing that again. It gets easier after the first review, I think. Um, do you have the same experience? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. But I remember you had uh, you mentioned that the, uh, I think uh, the most nerve wracking for you was the expressive. Yeah. yeah. But uh, there was four each before that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, four each was small, and people didn't have much to say about it. Right. Expressive was gigantic, and you know there there were political reasons why. It, uh, you yeah. Know, you know, so I was overlaps. And yeah, overlaps that, right? with these drag acts and all that other stuff. And it, it was very contentious and stressful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Were there any overall like 
really negative reviews that forced oh, yeah. something to change? Or sure, yeah. Did, did any, were there any large changes that came with that? Or? No, not really. No, not really. Um, here's the thing. Uh, I think um, one thing that we, we did was uh, we made spirit, we, we had a maturity stage. So after the Goose introduction, if you notice that, then it's one year after. The, uh, the review was one year after. So we, we spent time actually um, refining the code first before asking for review. I think, um, in my opinion, uh, some people get it wrong because if they have a library and they want it reviewed ag uh, immediately without going to the process of maturity. And um, I, in my opinion, um, it's, it's not a good idea to do it that way. One thing you haven't mentioned is the documentation, which I always thought was really nice and, and helped yeah, to understand sure. what you were doing. Yeah. What um, kind of shape was it in before and after review? Okay. Or? Um, um, before the review, um, that, that was um, when uh, when the first email got sent to Boost. Uh, I think that was just. Um, that was a single web page. Eight pages or something, mm -hmm. and then uh, after a year, focusing on um, the things to do, uh, including the documentation, preparing for the review. So uh, we made sure that uh, we had ample documentation. So th I think it's important to have that maturity time. So in our case, uh, we, uh, we what we did was. Uh, uh, there were a couple of um, contributors back then, so uh, we started the SourceForge project, and that's how we had Spirit somehow um, get into the mature state, ready for review. Wait. Um. Early on, we, we recognize or realize that, hey, if you really want to make a parcel library which is useful for people, we need to have at least one large application using Spirit and driving it, you know, just proving that it's work, that it works. And very early on, in late, when did I start Wave 2001? 2001. 2001. December 2001. He nudged me in, in doing a preprocessor for, for C, C++. And that was the beginning of the Wave library. Uh, today, Wave uh, is a standards conformant implementation of the uh, standard, of the preprocessor part of the standard. At that point in time, that was a huge deal because there was only one preprocessor available who really was standards conformant. And that was the preprocessor of GCC 3. Point something. Uh, all other preprocessors were utterly broken. And that's what Paul Mansonides, we will talk about them, and these are always complained about that they had to, to put so many workarounds into the Goose preprocessor library to make it work on, on different uh, compilers that it almost it was not nice anymore. And if you look at the code, you will see a branch, essentially, the whole preprocessor library has a branch for, which, uh, for Microsoft, mm -hmm. it has a branch for EDG, it has a branch for more or less conformant compilers. In there. And if you look into the source of the preprocessor library, you will find in the config file a if dev underscore underscore spirit underscore pp underscore. So spirit preprocessor. It was a very beginning of wave when we started to be more or less conformant. At that point, uh, Paul added that immediately to the preprocessor library, and it invokes the standard conformant part of the library for for wave. We never changed that to the wave pre predefined preprocessor constant. It's still this spirit TP. That was the first thing. Yeah, it has been rewritten in 2003 to implement. And one, one interesting thing, we Paul, who was a guy who, who finally finished the boost preprocessor library and then submitted it for, for review, one of two guys I know who really understand the preprocessor and really wrap their brain around. I don't know how they did that. I still have problems sometimes to understand what the preprocessor is doing. And um, he was very active at the committee at that time and was very forceful and wanted to uh, bring macro namespaces into the standard because of these 
you know, global namespace of our macro splash and so on. And what we did at that time, we implemented his suggestion how macro namespaces could look like in Wave. And if you dig into the sources and find old version of Wave, you still have the macro namespaces in there. And he even wrote a complete library using these macro namespaces just to prove that that has really broke out properly. And by the way, he got he attended several committee meetings and in one committee meeting they had a huge fight with with Bjarne in front of everybody. They were standing up and shouting shouting at each other that <laughs> Bjarne didn't want to get these namespaces into him. And uh, Paul is very eager and very young and he was shouting at Bjarne, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you see that we need them and things like that? And it all calmed down, and, and nobody is talking about macro namespaces now. Uh, another thing which is very useful in the Stellan wave, and by the way, when you, whenever you have any problems with macro expansion, I, I suggest looking at that. Wave is able to give you a macro expansion trace. So if you have a complex macro and want to see how does it expand, use the macro expand and the, the trace feature in Wave. It shows you neatly, oh, that macro, I pull that from here, I use these arguments and expand that, and it shows you the, the two-stage macro expansion which is going on underneath. So it's, it's a nice tool to understand what macro expansion really is. It has been announced on the boost list in August 2003. And it's in boost, uh, I had my review of Wave in 2005, and at that time it was the second fully conformant preprocessor, which is which was available. And by the way, I today I think Wave was a nice project for two reasons. First, it pushed Spirit quite hard and, and helped to coin out different things there. And second, it pushed the compiler levels. And the preprocessor, which are nowadays more or less conformant, I mean, Clang has an excellent one, GCC has just got better. Uh, Microsoft had, has been doing some work there. Most compiler vendors feel obliged to put some love into their preprocessor. And that's, I think, why it's a bit too bad. Yeah, I mean, the rest is just history. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to emphasize mainly because it's interesting still today. Um, when I started to develop Wave, which is a huge template in the end, or a set of templates, I had compilation times around 30 minutes when you like, just when you wanted to compile a program that was on Intel, Microsoft wasn't able to compile it at all. And I thought, no, that can't be the solution. And um, essentially, if you look at the code from, from Wave, you have some huge template and the whole implementation here somewhere and then number functions and a whole tree of dependent templates which had to be instantiated to make that all work. And it, as you know it's very difficult to decouple those. I mean whoever worked with templates who will know how that is. And what I did at that time was I discovered explicit template special uh, instantiation which works very well. Uh, just removes the definition of the function from the header file. I have a separate header file containing the definition and instantiate, and, and the client sees only this one, and the library has an explicit template instantiation pulling both header files and telling the compiler, hey, I need that template with this template parameter. That certainly restricts things because you are restricted to one certain set of types, but it's fairly easy to add other ones. You just add small mm, files to, to your library and compile them separately. And that's what Spirit, uh, Wave is doing nowadays still. When you compile Wave every day, when you pull boost and compile it, the five or six files com compiled for the Wave library are five lines. They just pull in part of, of the library and compile them for a predefined set of files. Why well, I mentioned that is um, Spirit pushes compilers hard. I mean, it has been pushing it for years and still pushes it very hard. And many people complain that it's a problem because compiler times are huge <coughs> still nowadays. And I still think that this technique is 
part of the solution for now how to remedy these, these huge big power problems. That's why I'm mentioning it. It's not that I invented that. I mean, <laughs> it was understandable the template uh, instantiation, the explicit one. But I think uh, it's the only library boost you in the technique. Uh, the serialization is it too. Yep, <laughs> serialization. Yeah. Okay. Then it was just the first library. <laughs> Um, yeah, the list of uh, people using Wave. If you know more, please tell me. Uh, yeah, that's when I introduced that uh, to the boost list. I got a couple of nice comments there. Paul Mansonides, this guy I mentioned already. I would say, Eric, who sent him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but what I want to show on that slide is I when mentioned I it was huge. I meant the compile times. Probably. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> <laughs> it might have just worked. <laughs> 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 we really I wonder meant what that. What that means then? I was going to say if he really meant that, that would have said WTF. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you blew the compiler. <laughs> yeah. Like that. yeah, there there have been two guys working on preprocessor stuff. That these are Carbonen, the one we saw already, and Paul Mansonides. And these two guys didn't get along at all. You know, completely different minds, completely different mindset in terms of what to do with a preprocessor. One was more uh, functional oriented, and the other one, Paul, was more straight in terms of. Uh, imperative paradigms for preprocessor programming, and they didn't get along, and they had f huge fights on, on the mailing list. And this whole thing culminated uh, when Tom Mansonides wrote a strict PPLib, as he called it. It's just a rewrite of the boost preprocessor library, not doing any workarounds for broken preprocessors. And this thing got called Chaos PP. <laughs> it's a very uh, complete. Library. It's Turing complete, it's much more powerful than boost preprocessor library still available, and it's very much in the vein of the boost preprocessor library. And his first announcement was, I think, it up in October 2003. He mentioned it first on the boost list. Now, what? Besa, two weeks later, announced the fun. It was just fun, and I saw that. <laughs> it was all. It's always fun reading the uh, mailing lists. Okay, back to scrolling. Okay, uh, we're we're run out of time, so I'll just burn through this um, as fast almost, as I can. Almost, almost yeah. Okay. Okay. So attribute grammars now. So uh, spirit two now. Ha has what's called um, attribute grammars. We didn't have that, but we originally we had only for primitives. So everything else, if you compose those primitives, you have transduction parsing. So you, you just uh, you'll just be given the first class iterators when you have a successful parse in your semantic actions. So yeah, it's an awkward situation. So while this is okay because integer p is, uh, exposes an attribute, this is not. You can't do that. So you can't extract the attribute of that and attribute of that and somehow do something with it. So we need the tuples. We need we, uh, we, we, these. These are tuples. The parsers are uh, based on tuples, so the realization there is that we needed uh, uh, to work on heterogeneous types, and we, we needed to have algorithms that work on heter uh, heterogeneous types. So we needed something like MPL, but with um, algorithms and with values. So the challenge was to do this, something like that, where you, in your semantic action, you can extract each of the attributes of those guys there. So we need 
to do something with that. So the solution uh, at that point was uh, to flatten ex uh, uh, the expression. trees, expression trees, and then walk this tree and the attribute tree. So um, and, um, and I might not be making sense, but uh, essentially you have something like this. You have a sequence where you have A, B, C. These are all parsers with possibly different types. And you, you pass it in an attribute with also, also with three types, which are the attributes types of each of those parsers. So at parse time, you walk these two trees in parallel, extract and um, ask each of these two parts, extract the attributes, and then pass it on into your semantic action in the form of tuples. So it was quite tricky back then. Uh, we only had tuples, uh, which didn't have algorithms. So there's no way to, to do transforms and for each and all those stuff. So that's how spirit came to be. Fusion. I'm sorry. Fusion came to me. Okay. Initially developed as a proof of concept in 2002 based on MPL and seminal work by Doug. Um, he had this um, mini library this, as, as a proof of concept that does that. Uh, we just, the gap between compile time, MPL, and SPL. Uh, I think you know all this already, so I can go through that. Same here, so I won't go through that. Okay, now, the invasion of the ETs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Expression templates were all the range at that point, at the time. Uh, well, we were originally the, the crazy programmers back then, but now we have a lot more. And of course, uh, there were um, libraries uh, then that um, pushed the limits of the compilers. Um, and there are libraries there that uh, are expression template based, Wine, Lambda, Phoenix. So Expressible was also, uh, of course, um, expression templates. Spirit karma. So um, the problem before, and it's still a problem now, and uh, it, it's hopefully it will soon be solved. Uh, there were a plethora of different uh, placeholders and stuff that don't work well with each other. And there you go. That's a solution. Is it Toronto? Yes. So we have Proto. It's a framework for building domains. I, I stole this from Eric's um, documentation. Uses development of domain specific embedded languages, DCLs. I added this. Never again shall we write yet another operator overload. <laughs> Never again shall we write an inordinate amount of unreadable and Unmeetable template mumbo jumbo. I think that's from Eric. That's a fall. Our mini languages seamlessly interoperate. Case in point, key and karma. So you only have one placeholder for key and karma and it's interpreted differently. I'd like to invite Eric to do this slide if it's okay. <laughs> I stole him from this from his slides. Um, sorry, his documentation. Oh, oh thank you, thank you. Um, so, uh, so I wrote this uh, library called Expressive, which is a lot like Spirit, except it uses regular expressions instead of cursive descent parsers. And uh, just like uh, the Spirit, uh, and Joel and, and Hartnett, I had this uh, problem of. Uh, template spaghetti code, um, kind of a mishmash of uh, data uh, and algorithm all uh, inseparably combined. And this problem of trying to, you know, refactor and make improvements every time, you know, as Expressive grew, it became harder to make changes. So finally, I just decided out of hell that I'm just going to throw it all out and start all over. 
and uh, Proto was born uh, as a, a major uh, refactorization of Expressive's uh, metaprogramming. Um, and at that point, it, uh, it didn't have grammars, it didn't have transforms, it didn't have anything else. Um, and uh, it wasn't terribly powerful at all, and yet I was convinced that it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And uh, worked very hard to get Joel and Hartman to, uh, to use it for Spirit 2. And they were like, well, this is crap, and it doesn't meet any of our needs. But that was the, essentially the, uh, the reaction I got on the spirit list when I floated this idea. So I went back. I was like, okay, okay, well, I could do this better. And so I rewrote Proto again, uh, and I, I had um, uniform expression types. And uh, as a result of this discussion on Boost, uh, uh, the Spirit Developers list, I got the idea for, for grammars. In fact, that was exactly the right place for me to have that discussion, because Spirit is a compiler. And at this time, I was thinking of Proto as uh, just an expression template library. Uh, I wasn't really thinking of domain-specific embedded languages as languages, and they really are. Um, and that Proto really should be a compiler for languages. But this thinking of it in terms of Spirit, it was really easy to see the the similarities. Oh, okay, I need, I need uh, grammars with rules, and I need the equivalent of semantic actions, right? Spirit has semantic actions, Proto should have them too, right? So, okay, uh, I came up with the idea for Proto matches and grammar. Uh, Hartman Kaiser uh, expressed some need that Proto wasn't uh, meeting, and then, oh, I was like, okay, we, well, we can do it this way, and transform the decorate grammar rules. Uh, also, as a result of the discussion on the, the Spirit mailing list, um, and then uh, I, I rewrote all of Expressive on top of the new version of Proto, worked great, uh, convinced me that since I could build Spirit, and uh, Spirit Key and Spirit Karma, and uh, not I, you guys could, and I could build Expressive on top of it, that it actually was useful for real stuff, made a submission to Boost, and, uh, and the rest is history. Yeah. Cool. Accepted cool. it to Boost uh, 2008. Thank you. Some, some, somewhere around here, uh, what's PS is Spirit 2, right? Yeah, it's the first one was Spirit 2. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It has been rewritten twice, so it's actually not Spirit 2, but Spirit 5, but we have to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, at some point, I realized, hey, if I have a grammar and I can pass something, why not use the same grammar to generate something? I and mean, if you describe the format of, of the thing you want to match, you can use the same description to recreate what you matched before. And since it's Spirit Backwards, the first name was Terrips. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> uh, first idea is 2004. It has been inspired a bit by the string template library, but the main crux is that, yeah, when, when you use a grammar to describe an input, you can use the same grammar to, uh, grammar to recreate that input in the output. And later in 2005 we called, we named it Karma after some, some chatting, and <coughs> then we saw, hey, now Karma and Spirit doesn't work good. <coughs> Let's name the Spirit at the parcel library differently as well, and, and the name key was prompted for the parcel part at that point in time. Um, yeah, generating output. Today is a symmetric part of Spirit, and just to quote Eric again, it's the yang to keys and yin. So it's the, exactly the opposite thing. Um, it's doing everything what key is doing for parsing for output generation. And yeah, why should you use that? For the same reason you are using a parser uh, generator. It just makes life so much easier. Finally, Alexa. That's the last part. And, and Many of you know that uh, we now have Alexa in our library as well. It's based on a external library written by Ben Hansen. I never met Ben, so I don't know who of those is Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ben Hansen has Should a... Should be the little one. Yeah, probably. I, I, I assume it's him. I never... I only email conversations with him so far. He's in, in Manchester, somewhere in the UK. Um, he, he wrote this excellent Lexa engine, and we implemented a wrapper around that again using Proto. It's actually three DSLs in, in Spirit, Lexa, Key, and, and Karma. But all of them are built using Proto. 
And the uh, Sporoflex is just a wrapper for, for the library, which is proposed for boost review as well. Okay, uh, all that couldn't have been happened without the help of hundreds of people. And that's just a small list of those we documented who contributed something to, to Spirit over the years. And as you can see, it's quite impressive, right? I mean, it's about 200 people which are officially recognized on the acknowledgements list. And there are a huge number of people more who at some point chimed in, made suggestions, contributed some small codes, and so on and so on. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any stories to tell? Ah, stories to tell. Oh, that'll be fun. Question, where are you guys going next? <laughs> going next in terms of what? Development? Or? Yeah, what's... Uh... I, th I thought for a second, drinking beer. Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to do a book? Yeah, we thought of that. But I'm oh, we are discussing that on time. and off for five years now, I think. What we decided to do is to write articles on the web and collect them on the web. Mm -hmm. And you know that probably on the school website. And we will pursue that. And when we have, I don't know, Enough 50, 50 and 80 articles there, we just bundle them together and perhaps publish them. Yeah, where we go next? If you attend our Monday session, uh, we think that going back to dynamic after 10 years is the, the way to go, but on a, on a next level. And I'm pretty sure this scheme stuff we presented on Monday will have influence way beyond of spirit because it's a very, very versatile tool you can use in, in many ways. So it will generate at least two, three new, new libraries. And, and comments of that. So if somebody wants to take it on and, and just put it forward. This is like sending executable code across, right? If you want, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you just have just the scheme expression from Palette on the other hand. And it's so I think um, it's more of the back end now that we want to focus on. <laughs> <laughs> Generating compilers and stuff like that. Thanks. Thank you.